Yeah, uh, my name is Thomas. <coughs> I do system level programming, all kinds of. I spent a few years with Mozilla, and I also work on PicoDM, which is today's topic. PicoDM is a, a C framework for running transactions and Z programs and running system level code with transactional semantics. Um, before we get to the transactional code, let us start with looking at some traditional code. Um, this is kind of the blueprint for, uh, for any application. Uh, so there are two file descriptors, FD0, FD1. And we have an input buffer there. We have an output buffer. There is this endless loop. And the endless loop waits for input. Um, it reads the input into an input buffer, computes an output buffer from the input, and then it writes the output to two files, which are described by FD0 and FD1. Um, so this could be uh, part of the firmware that's running on a weather monitoring station. And for a weather monitoring station, like wait for input, could wake up the system once per minute, then fill input buffer reads um, sensor data for the weather monitoring station, like temperature, humidity, uh, maybe wind direction, wind speeds. Then it computes some additional <coughs> some additional output from that input, like relative humidity, or maybe changes to previous measurements. And then the weather monitoring station writes the measured and computed data into a file and into a backup file. And maybe once per day, it switches on the antenna. And um, when that happens, it transfers all the, uh, the latest data from the last 24 hours to the central server for analysis and maybe for predicting the weather. Um, so usually this works quite well. But one day the following happens. The weather monitoring station, it wakes up um, from wait for input. Then it reads the sensor data into the input buffer. It computes the output buffer. Then it writes the output buffer to the first file. And then it tries to write the uh, output buffer to the second file, the backup file. And now a problem appears, the disk is full. Um, and now we are in a kind of a problematic situation here. Because if we want to go into a consistent state, either we go forward in our program. But going forward means we have to write our backup to make basically the data and the backup data match again. And we just try to write that backup file and it failed because this was full. But we cannot go back into the previous consistent state in this program, because going back would mean that we have to discard the, um, the data we just wrote to that file, but that write has already been performed, and we cannot easily go back. Um, so our program or our um, firmware for that weather monitoring station is now as some kind of inconsistent in the immediate state and probably report incorrect data or crash at some point in the future. Um, that was the first example. Second example, concurrency. Uh, still, we are not running transactional code. This is just for um, introducing the problem. Um, this time, we have one file descriptor, FD. And we have two threads. Thread number one computes an output buffer, writes it to FD. Uh, thread number two reads something from FD, processes the input buffer, and does something with whatever it read from the file. Um, so in terms of our weather monitoring station, the first thread could be part of the code that reads the data and updates the files. And the second thread could be part of the code that takes the measured data and transfers it to the central server. And if you look at this, I guess you've probably spotted the problem here. So there is a write and there is a read, and it runs concurrently. And there is zero protection among these, uh, between these threads. So when thread number one writes, the read could come in and just read something, whether it's uh, 42 or anything in between, or the old state, the new state, who knows? <coughs> 
Right, but um, this is a write to a file, and this reads from the same file. And this is the same, the FD is the same. Okay, yeah, FD is the same this time. Okay. okay. You have uh, a seek position is, uh, is the problem. Um, because typically you the may problem, have the problem, No, no, this is not really, this is a, pos a position independent read, and okay. this is the position. And they basically read, this one writes and this one reads, and they are at the same position, and they are this overlapping. So you have the race condition in the context? Exactly. Okay, now yeah. I okay, second example, still no transactions here. And um, if you look at this code, you see that here and here and on the previous slide, there is zero error checking, zero error testing. Even if an error occurs, this program would never notice that. Just happily continue to run until it doesn't run anymore. Um, so from these two examples, let's step back for a moment and see what we actually wanted for that code. Uh, which, which properties should it have? Um, so first of all, we want some kind of atomicity. Atomicity means, for example, in the first um, in the first case, um, either we write to the first file and to the second file, or not at all, but there should not be anything in between. In the second case, if we write, we want to do all the writes without the read coming in in between and reading inconsistent data while the write is still going on. Um, then we want some form of consistency. What consistency actually means always depends on the application, but usually you have a consistent state and then you have some non-consistent states and then you have a consistent state again. And the first example that was when we were basically waiting for an input that was consistent, then we had a number of intermediate steps where we were reading, computing, writing once, writing twice. They were all inconsistent at the end. We had updated both files and then we were consistent again. Next is isolation. The second example, um, there was a write, then there was a read. And uh, you don't want to have that read and write interfere. You want to do the writes and then have it done, and then you want this write to be visible in the reader code. And finally, once we have reached a consistent state, like once we have completely measured and computed the output and wrote it, that new system state should remain in the system. We don't want to go back accidentally um, into an old state, even if it is a consistent one. And uh, people here in the front were already laughing because I guess you've um, recognized that. This is usually, um, those are the four properties which are associated with transactions. So what we actually wanted in our code were transactions. Um, so very quickly, just to reiterate this, reiterate this, so we want to do everything or nothing in our code. Um, we want to basically move from consistent state to consistent state and uh, don't want to have the inconsistent states in between, at least not outside our transactions. Then we want the effects that happen in one transaction be isolated from all the other stuff that runs on the system um, at least until that, commit, uh, that transaction commits. And once it commits, everything becomes visible. And um, if we committed a transaction, we don't want this new state to disappear from the system. Um, there are many, many, many databases. Um, but databases are always kind of a a world on their own. <clears throat> so you get the software and you have tons of ways for configuring and turning knobs here and there. But in the end, <clears throat> it comes down to some, some blob which you cannot really, you cannot freely program. Uh, or if you can, then you, well, you probably could not implement an operating system with a traditional database. Um, and our examples in the first place, they were all C, and they were all more or less generic programs. 
Um, there isn't much. But one of the solutions that is there is Pico DM. Um, the remaining slides will have lots of C or pseudo C. Um, will be based on Pico TM, but remember that this is the design pattern track of the conference. So the things you will see here in, that we can do with Pico TM, you could do this in other languages um, with other frameworks. There is nothing, I guess, specific to C or the framework we're using here. So what is Pico TM? It's a transaction manager for C applications and firmware. It's a shared library or static library if you want it that way. Um, can run it on, on Linux, on firmware, wherever. It's fairly modular. So the transaction manager itself does not have any actual functionality. But you can write modules on top of it and extend it for whatever um, system you have. I will get back to the initial examples in a bit. Let me just explain how a typical uh, transaction looks like. So um, this is C code, which could be part of a C program. Um, it's, um, there is a begin statement for each transaction. There is a commit statement for each transaction. And there's an end statement for each transaction. And those three are provided by the framework itself. Um, implemented as some macro magic, but it's kind of the good macro. They just hide complexity. They don't add any awful side effects. Um, so a transaction starts with begin. And at begin, the framework saves the instruction pointer, saves the stack pointer, and then initializes the framework internally, just a few variables. After begin, the execution phase starts, and that is where the application programmer lists the, uh, the transactional code, so what the transaction is supposed to do. Um, when the execution uh, is done, the commit follows. The commit is provided by the framework, and at commit time, as you would expect, the transaction gets applied to the system, and when that is successful, um, it becomes the new system state. And after commit, the framework um, goes to end, and after end, the next instruction in the C program is executed. Um, we will have an example later, but this was much cleaner, uh, clearer. Um, if an error occurs, during the execution or commit, the framework will detect that, go to recovery, and during recovery, an application programmer can uh, specify um, error correction uh, strategies or can implement certain error handling, whatever fits the program. Okay, first example again, this time as transaction. Again, you see we'll have two file descriptors, FD1, FD0. There's an input buffer, there's an output buffer. There is this while loop again. That while loop waits for an input like in the case of a weather monitoring, story, weather monitoring station, breaking up once per minute. But this time, after the wake up, it starts a transaction. Uh, let's go first through this um, when everything works well. So the transaction begins, where we save our stack pointer, our instruction pointer. Um, we do some internal setup. Um, then we have fill input buffer TX. The input buffer TX is a transactional implementation of the uh, previous fill input buffer function. Why is this important? I will get to in a bit when we come to error handling. So we fill our input buffer within the transaction. Um, we compute the output buffer within the transaction. We do a transactional write. And transactional writes are not yet applied. They are just saved somewhere um, as transactional state. We do another. A transactional write to the other file descriptor. And again, we're not really doing that. We are just saving it for later. Then the commit comes. During a commit, the framework gets the opportunity to retest and um, see if this transaction is likely to 
commit, if there are any errors which could occur, if there are any other problems which could occur. And if the commit is successful, the rights to those files now get applied. And um, the system or the different framework goes to end. And next after end is basically to go back and restart the loop um, once more. So far, there isn't actually anything new here or anything exciting. This is what the old program also did. Um, it's getting more interesting when we have an error in the system. So we wake up and we start our transaction. Save instruction pointer, stack pointer, do some internal initialization. And we fill our input buffer in fill input buffer TX. And for weather monitoring station, this could mean reading from sensors, from hardware sensors, things like temperature or humidity. And maybe um, those sensors, they are still shut down or they're like, not really well calibrated. And that function now detects that there's something wrong with the, um, with the sensor it's trying to read from. And what it does now is the following. It does not return into the execution phase and it does not really report any error here. Instead, it instructs, it instructs the framework that it needs recovery. And um, the framework now rolls back the transaction and goes to recovery. And recovery is listed here. And this is where the programmer can specify code for dealing with errors that can occur during program execution. Um, so there are things that are really not repairable at all. In those cases, just send an email to the admin, shut down the device, and be done with it. Um, it's kind of the exit strategy. So when everything really severely go wrong, at least send an email out and shut down the device safely. But usually, we can try to repair an error. Um, in the case of the, um, uh, the sensor problem we had, handle error and retry, that function here, could implement a strategy for maybe powering up a sensor if it's still powered down, or maybe um, if it needs some sort of calibration, um, it could try to recalibrate the sensor. And um, so handle error and retry does something to fix the error. Then it calls restart, restart, instructs the PicoTM framework to restart the transaction. And now the transaction goes back to begin. It calls again fill input buffer TX. And this time it works because we just repaired that error that had when we tried to read the sensor. So this time we get a valid input buffer. Now we compute our output buffer. Computing the output buffer could, for example, involve allocating memory from the system and later freeing it and using it for some temporary storage. Um, but maybe there another, there's another error and the system is out of memory. So that call to malloc, which is in this function, will fail and return null. And there is a, sets the error null variable to enormal. <clears throat> Again, when that happens, this function doesn't return into the execution phase. It instructs the framework to roll back the transaction and start recovery. Rolling back just means go back to begin. And, um, Go to recovery. Recovery would call this function, handle error, and retry. And this time we see, OK, we are out of memory. Maybe we could flash some caches or, um, I don't know, run a garbage collector if we have that. Somehow it frees memory. So we again restart our transaction. And uh, next try, we read the, in read the sensors into the input buffer. We compute the output buffer. This time it works. We just freed memory. And um, we can now compute the output buffer with the memory we just freed during our recovery. Um, we do the transactional write to FD0, no problem. We try, uh, we try to do the uh, transactional write to FD1. But again, we have this problem that our disk is full, and there needs to be a way to handle it. So, um, when write TX to FD1 detects that probably that write would not be committed because our disk is 
running low on space. It does not return, it does not report an error to the execution code. It instructs the PicoTM framework to roll back the transaction. Rolling back this time um, means uh, we are throwing away that write we did here, or at least we, we saved here for later commit. We are undoing anything we are doing, we did in the output buffer TX function. Uh, fill input buffer TX didn't have any side effects. And then we're back at begin. And from begin, again, we go to recovery, handle error and retry for a disk full error could try to somehow um, free up memory on the disk. I don't know, delay some temporary files or something like that. Somehow we free up memory. We do the restart again, go back to begin, and uh, fill the input buffer, compute the output buffer, uh, do the first transaction write, do the second transaction write. This time, framework thinks, OK, there's enough this space available. This transaction or this write is likely to be committed later. And then we're done with the execution. We go to commit. And during commit, um, we can revalidate and retest again if uh, that transaction is likely to commit or to generate an error. And if everything is good, we commit and we're back. Uh, we go to the end and start our loop again. And in principle, any, um, any transaction that goes, detects an error, goes through recovery, and restarts and successfully commits is just as good as one that directly goes to commit and commits successfully. Um, One slide about implementation, um, kind of the backbone for all transactional systems are logs of some sort, and it's like that here. So there is um, a transaction log that the framework keeps for all running transactions. And um, <clears throat> this is a full log for the whole example we just saw. So we start, then we did the fill input buffer, which did not do anything. Then we had the compute output buffer and internally allocated memory and it freed memory. Then um, we had the uh, two writes and at the end we commit. Um, functions that do not have any side effects, they don't need to be mentioned in the log. But there are things like those writes and we don't want to write until we actually commit. So whenever we call write TX, it will put an entry into the transaction log for later processing during commit. And um, if we have a function like malloc in our transaction, then our transaction cannot simply go back and restart because before it restarts, it has to free the memory it just allocated with malloc. So whenever malloc runs, malloc TX, um, it puts an entry into the log. And um, when our transaction has to be, uh, has to um, abort, then the framework goes through the log basically backwards and undoes any operation that needs to be undone. So um, the functions that are delayed until commit, they are shown in orange here, and the blue function is undone if the transaction has to be aborted. Um, second example, this time concurrency. Um, as before, in the non-transactional code, we have one file descriptor and we have two threads, this time implemented with transactions. Our first thread runs a transaction. It starts at begin. Um, you can see that it computes the output buffer. It does a transactional write to the file. It does a commit. There is some error handling code there. There is end. And once it reaches the end statement, it's basically done. And um, the thread quits. And the second thread, um, uh, it just reads from the same file that is written by the first thread. 
And then after the end of the transaction, that input is processed. And in the case of our, our um, uh, weather monitoring station, so this code would be part of the uh, part of the part of the firmware that measures and writes to the file, and this is part of the sending code which transfers the files or the file contents to the central servers. Um, now, let's say we start with thread number one, and we start our transaction with begin. Begin saves the stack pointer, saves the stack pointer, saves the instruction pointer. Um, it computes the output buffer and does the write. And now after the write, but before the commit, it gets descheduled and thread number two gets scheduled by the operating system. And it also starts its transaction and it tries to read. And this time it will not read inconsistent data because um, when a transactional write occurs, um, the code takes the logs for the, uh, for the part of the file where the write takes place. So when the read occurs, it also tries to take these logs. But the logs are held for that region and the file are held by the first transaction. And because the second transaction cannot acquire the logs for that region and the file, uh, it can detect the conflict and act accordingly. And acting accordingly means telling the framework that we just, or that this transaction just uh, discovered a, um, a problem of uh, concurrency, and uh, the framework is now supposed to somehow handle that error and resolve the problem. Um, resolving the problem in the simplest case means just uh, roll back the transaction and start anew. And while we're doing that, so read tells the framework, okay, I cannot continue here, I can't acquire these logs, please do something about it. The framework rolls back, the transaction starts um, from begin, and maybe in between it gets descheduled and the first thread again gets scheduled and can continue with the commit. You know, it's last time it stopped at the right, so it now does the commit. And um, at the end of the commit, those logs are released and um, the transaction is done and the thread, one, uh, thread number one goes away. Thread number two, it will now restart. It does the read, this time it works because the read can acquire the locks. It does the commit and processes the input buffer. And uh, likewise, uh, you could turn this example around. So first the read um, runs and it acquires the log successfully and then when thread number one comes and tries to write, it cannot acquire logs and so on. <clears throat> um, all of the, the functionality which I've been talking about the whole time now is implemented as modules. Um, really the framework is those three begin, commit, end statements, some internal code, the restart, but all these functions that are labeled or that end with TX, they are provided by modules. And those modules are running on top of the framework and when you have a new system or when you have a um, a different problem or maybe a new library that you want to run a transaction, you can write a module for that and basically register the module um, with the framework and then interact with the framework and the framework interacts with the module and that's how you can extend and uh, basically apply this to your use case. And there are really just three functions here. Um, register module, as the name says, it registers a module with the framework, and there are like all these function pointers here, they're called when the framework wants the module to do something. Um, lock and unlock, they lock data structures that are maintained by a module. Um, you have a function for validating consistency, so see if that um, transaction is still running on consistent data or if that data has been updated. 
by concurrent transaction is now inconsistent with what the uh, transaction expects. Um, you're applying undo functions for applying and undoing events that are listed in that transaction's transaction log. Um, update concurrency control and clear is something like lock and unlock. There's a finish function which runs at the end of the transaction, and there's an uninit which basically runs at the end of the thread. Um, then there's another function, append event. If your module has, a, um, has something to report to the framework and to be applied or undone later, append event can be used. Um, and if there's an error or concurrency problem, um, recover from error does that. And PicoDM error is basically some sort of generic error structure which describes the error to the framework. Um, so in the case of, let's say, a transactional malloc, um, transactional malloc, when it first runs on a thread, it needs to register the module. It needs to be done only once per thread. And it would hand in a function pointer for undoing any effects that a malloc had, um, basically freeing the memory that was allocated by malloc. And um, next for a malloc TX would be to actually allocate memory from the system's allocator. And if that succeeds, append an event to the transaction log um, and return the allocated memory. Um, if there is no more memory in the system, recover from error, uh, would report that to the framework, and um, the error structure would then contain the error code or some, um, some constant saying, basically, we're out of memory, do something about it. And you can query that information during the recovery to react upon it. Um, so basically, any module or any command has to first register module, then do whatever it does, and if it works, append an event, if it fails, recover from error. Okay. And as I said, um, this heavily relies here on the framework in my examples and in the, on, on, on C code, but in principle this could be done in any language with any framework. Um, yeah. So which modules are there which are supported? First of all, transactional memory. And uh, transactional memory is something like um, the file I.O. examples we just had. Just this time we're working on memory locations. So there is a load TX and store TX. When that is executed in a transaction, um, you can load tr non-transactional um, variables into the transaction context or store transactional variables somewhere to the outside of the transaction. Um, both of these functions, um, they acquire locks for these regions. So uh, when you have like a number of transactions and a number of global variables and all these transactions they read and write or load and store the variables, then the transaction memory component would uh, do the concurrency control. And there's a similar function, um, privatize. And with privatize, um, you don't get a copy, you get the actual location in your transaction. So when you load, it copies out of that location. When you privatize that global memory location, your, your transaction can access it directly. And with privatize, you can do things like mem copy and string copy and compare and such things. Um, and here, a mem copy, for example, would mean privatize the source buffer, privatize the um, destination buffer, and do a regular mem copy. And um, all the concurrency control um, would be done by the underlying transactional memory component. And the others work similar, compare and string stuff. There are tons of these functions, and it's always the same. Privatize and do the function. Then um, <coughs> memory allocation. We had this in the examples. So malloc allocates, or malloc TX allocates during a transaction. And if you have to roll back your transaction, the allocated memory is freed automatically. And free is um, basically free operation. 
but it's delayed until the commit actually takes place. So if you do this in your transaction and you have to roll back and you have to restart, then the memory will still be there because you did not yet commit the foo. Um, we have seen finite O in the examples. Um, there's also open and close, so you can open a file, um, you can close a file. Open is similar to a malloc, so when um, you open in a transaction and then the transaction aborts and rolls back, then the file you just open is automatically closed. And uh, read and write are, have been in the examples. And there is more, um, there's um, Erno, so when you have a function in your transaction that somehow modifies the Erno variable, um, you can save Erno. And when your transaction rolls back, Erno is restarted, uh, restored, so a transaction always um, restarts with the same value in Erno. There is some support for the math library. Um, all the math functions are there. Um, there is support for changing the floating point environment. So if your transaction somehow changes uh, rounding mode or something like that, during a rollback, the old rounding mode for floating point is restored. And there are exceptions supported. So just like Erno, if you have a, if one of these math functions fails and um, fails with a floating point exception, then it will be detected by the function and recovery will be started. And during a rollback, um, the exception state of the transaction will be restored to the old value. And there's some support for the file system, but file systems, well, they are shared by a lot of programs, so you can never fully guarantee anything there. Um, for example, when you create a file in the file system, and then your transaction rolls back and delays the file, there's no guarantee that there isn't any other program which just comes in and creates the same file again, um, but you can do a bit there. Um, so to summarize that presentation, um, designing or writing code with this transactional pattern uh, will, be, um, will lead to safer code and less error-prone code because all the complicated stuff, the concurrency control, the error detection, um, the error handling, is only written once and can be shared among transactions um, for things like the Zebra library and Unix stuff, which is currently supported um, even among um, applications, different systems. So all the hard problems are solved once. All that is left to implement is the actual execution and some error handling. Um, the framework itself is available at picodm.org. It's um, MIT license, so fairly liberal. You can do anything with it. Um, if the topic is interesting to you, you could check out the blog I have. I write tutorials about this. Um, how to implement transactional memory, how to do transactional malloc and free, and things like that. Um, I'm also on Twitter, or you can write me an email if you want. So if you don't remember anything from this presentation, at least remember picodm.org. And that's it. How do you make sure that the commit is at home? Depends on the system. So first of all, at the beginning of the commit, you, you instruct your modules to lock all the resources that a transaction uses. And you have this validate step where you can kind of see if there are any um, problems in the system which could lead to an abort. Or if you have optimistic concurrency control, you, could, uh, you have to validate that the, um, uh, the, tr the transaction still runs on consistent data. And then the next step is kind of uh, depends on the system. So if you have, um, if you have a, a system or if you have modules that implement two-phase commit, you can do that. You do things and then you have that magic bit which enables everything you just did during a commit for a 
low-level system transaction like the file writes here, you cannot really um, fully guarantee transactions and bindings during a commit. And only atomicity is no problem, um, but you cannot do things like error handling, which can still fail unless you have two-phase commit. And that depends on whatever you're running on. That depends on the module. You can have pessimistic or optimistic. And pessimistic, I guess, is the simple thing. Um, I had this, I had optimistic in an old version of this code, and I removed it because it was entirely useless. It was too slow and did not prove. So it reminds me to my old database lecture as a student. What I so, uh, is it more like a framework for implementing several kinds of transactional strategies? No, no. 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 But what, it provides some strategies. Um, well. So, are we at the meta level of transactional in general, or have you a concrete transactional strategy like, uh, for example, um, the transaction for the Bitcoin mining network is very complex? Um, the framework itself, Piquity and the framework itself, does not provide any functionality like file I.O. or um, it just provides the basics, the, the raw framework. And then you have these modules. Uh, yeah. Does it mean that I have to write this read underscore TX myself? Um, yes and no. Yes and no. Because the framework, it's, it, it already comes with these functions and you can use them. And that's the idea to reuse. But if you have, your, you have a new problem, you will have to write uh, basically an implementation of the transaction uh, code. Uh, the question is, well, if you have a code which has not the suffix, uh, underscore. Oh, then you write, have to write a, a module which implements this. OK. So in a sense, all C statements, all of them have to be converted to underscore TX. Uh, uh, no, not really. Just what, what's yeah. the difference to try catch in C++? Um, uh, so it does not really go back. The try catch is also, so you have a code path where you try something and then it goes wrong and you have a catch. Yeah, but it's, oh. you, it does not, you know. You, you, well, as I said, it's a design pattern. So, and if you have a C++ construct and you do a try catch, it will kind of clean up and undoes things. But there is no additional error check and there is no commit. Yes, but I could implement it. And there is no restart. Yes, but I could implement it in C++. And, yeah, yeah, of course. If I have to implement something, so the question is, so if I have already the functionality yeah. in place, I can directly use it without, it's a no-brainer. Uh, so where's exactly the value here? The the is the transaction manager. Yeah, you cannot. Well, look, uh, this. Yeah, because you have this in a, in a framework, like, like structured names of methods and whatever, and you could log it and have it somewhere. And if you do it yourself, you implement it like you have a mutex and, and you say, okay, I'll yeah. back and whatever. Yeah. This is okay. But, but the TM part is the interesting part, I guess. And you have like a, a, a one, central, one central point of code where you say, okay, now we enter this code here, and this is critical. All, all this. this yeah, I guess that was what I was trying to tell the yeah. last <laughs> the last hour. <laughs> yeah. And if you look, um, you, it might be easier in C++ to do this, or harder depending on what kind of C++ you write. Um, Doing it in C will usually, you will end up with things like go to error handling and you have some, you have your C function and at the end of the C function there is this error handling block which rolls back the effects of the function and whenever your function occur, sees an error in a C function it jumps into the error handling and then undoes. No, 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 anyway. 
typically you don't have it, but you, you can have some external functions can also do it. So okay. I was just thinking of what about deadlocks? Deadlocks? Deadlock. Uh, cannot, cannot occur. Because first of all, you have two-phase locking. And whenever you see, you, whenever you see, whenever you try to acquire a lock and it fails, um, the module which sees the arrow instructs the framework, and the framework will recover. And recovering means rolling back the transaction. As part of that, all the locks are released. And um, yeah. So the sort of framework will never wait until a resource becomes available, but if it's not available, then it will roll back immediately. Um, that depends on, it also depends. Well, if, the, if you're now waiting, then you can have it at all. Yes, but, wait, yeah, okay. It, well, it can, you can wait if you know exactly which transaction waits for which other transaction. So you can, you can avoid cycles. And that's how transactional, transaction engines or transaction managers usually solve this. So when you tell the PicoDM framework um, that you cannot acquire a lock, and the framework knows which, which transaction has this lock acquired, you can wait for that transaction. And if there is a cycle building up and closes, then one, of course, has to, has to restart. Um, so restarting is kind of the naive implementation of that, but could be optimized. There, there's another. There's a bit of different question. So what about performance? Kind of, you have a lot of um, checking happening. I don't have any meaningful performance data, sorry. Long ago I had this, and then I rewrote a lot of this code, and there's no performance so far. So memory and hardware. Yeah, you, I know, and it, it's, only use, it's only useful for things like log elision. As soon as you do a system call or any more complicated stuff, but just forget about hardware transaction memory. For example, to write a module for, for example, for, for using some hardware support, if you have a processor with a new feature, for example, could you use it in some, some way? I, um, okay. I've, been, I've been thinking about that, and in principle it can be done. I think the GCC, it comes with transaction memories, memory support. I think, I'm not sure, but I think they have a hybrid system where they run hardware transaction memory, and if that fails, they switch to software transaction memory, where they, they acquire all the locks there in software, which is what the framework here does. So um, I, I think this could be implemented here as well. Hybrid transactional memory systems, they exist. More questions? Who was first of you three? So I just yeah. Um, so uh, about the read TX and write TX, uh, do they copy the buffers internally? Because you don't know the program might change the buffers at the right yeah. second time with different buffers but the same pointers. So do you have to copy all the, the bytes that are written or read um, um, for implementations? Yes, only, only for writing. So reading, reading basically means you go to the file, read whatever is there. And first of all, um, you acquire the logs and then do the read. So there is no additional buffer involved. And for writing, um, you, have, you need a write set, of course. And that write set is committed when a transaction commits. Yeah. Yeah. Does that mean you have uh, immutable memory model? Your model is similar to functional languages which are just immutable. Allocate I'll, I'll think about the same as in JavaScript. JavaScript is called the pure JS. Yes, that's, yeah. that's a question. Could, could it, uh, is it similar to that or not? I, I don't know what this is, so okay. sorry. Yeah, I Can I have you allocate this? memory once and compute the values and put place it there and never change it during the time. If you ever have variable, change the variable value, you are always allocated new memory somewhere else, and you have just switching, uh, point of switching to the new location, and your variables are never updated. Never. Exactly. That's, that's, that's the basic idea. I know it only from that. Uh, this is also a potential really. memory model supported by hardware by Yeah. 
way of implementing transactional, transactional content. Mm. Mm. Yeah? So it, it, it's interesting uh, whether you are using uh, similar content in some cars or even everywhere, or even everywhere. Um. Functional memory. It's also research. Uh, the well, research games we need to go about. For for pure memory, you have um, two strategies. Either you do some kind of write-back scheme, which probably is what you mean. I'm still not quite sure what this Java thing is we were talking about. Um, or you have some write-through scheme where you save the old value. But what, you what I mean, some functional languages list has even started in the 60s. Before. Yeah. Never uh, hash counting, for example, in this. Is one, one example uh, of a very early system which never changes any memory. But it changes memory. It always creates new copies of everything. Mm -hmm. No, that's not what this does. Okay. How do you implement? How is that log implemented? How is what a deadlock? You said you you are carrying a or you are writing a log of the actions so that you could revert or undo them or repeat them. So that log is a memory structure. Or uh, yeah, it's just an it's just a regular C array which is dynamically allocated, and the new event it, any any event consists of a module number, which is handed out by the framework to the module when it registers. And there is an opcode which is local to the module. So the framework, the core framework doesn't have to know that. And there is a user pointer with just data. It's fairly trivial. Uh, so, so are you not using POSIX logs or anything or with files? Are you using so internal logging? Um, yes, internal. Uh, I, tr I try to. I try to stay as close as well. No, I try to stay as close as possible um, to the POSIX semantics when I implemented this. So, but this wouldn't work if you worked like you have two two processes. No, this does not work. No, you have to acquire system logs for that. Or if you have I don't know snapshots in your file system, this could work. But these commands would be. Uh, you could do this automatically, of course, but I guess a better strategy would be to just provide support within a transaction for the statements which do things like allocating POSIX logs on the file regions. Or use Barrow as snapshots. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> for rollback, just as an idea. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, the question is how, how, far, uh, how, how fast do you want it? And, um, there are certain limitations on Linux and Unix systems uh, for concurrency control and file system and file system stuff. And then if you really want to do all the locking and really be, um, be on the safe side and maybe even run transactional code and non-transactional code that work on the same data structures, you're going crazy and it's not feasible, I think. But if you have just an application with threads and um, um, transactions and they work on shared data structures, it will work to a good part. And um, for additional, are we over time already? No. Okay, so for, yeah, for additional, let's say, guarantees like system-wide locking or so, um, it's not done by default, but the commands could be integrated in the framework. I have one last question. Yes. You just come back a few slides where I want to do it. Orange bubbles. This is a decision made by the implementer of the module, which are the data operations and which are uh, reverse operations, isn't it? Yes. OK. And um, exactly what? Which operation does what depends on your strategy and your module. Um, so as an additional example, maybe for if you work on memory, you could have your transaction store everything in a local write set, and then during the commit, update the memory. But you could also um, save the memory's old value somewhere, do the writes immediately, and then if you have the rollback, just apply the old stuff again. Uh, could also work. Well, it sounds similar to a component in database systems called block manager to me. Yes. Uh, 
not, not really, but in memory only. Uh, <laughs> difficult question. A lock manager should support weights and deadlock detection. Yes, and this is not my question about deadlock. Or is it easier to write such a lock manager with your framework? Well, the lock manager with CK, L-O-C-K, is part of the framework. Your module should not have to manage the locks. All it does is to acquire a lock data structure, which is just a struct in C. And whatever happens to these locks is done internally in the framework. But your lists here, you have uh, some kind of um, records are locked of what logger, what, what kind of locks you have acquired. Uh. Well, at a very abstract level, it is. But at a very abstract level, yeah. it is. No, no, no. Only at a very abstract level. Okay. So it's actually a log of the stuff you did, which has side effects. Um, side effects are and if that involves any locks with CK, then it's the problem of the modules which acquire these locks. Uh, but it's not really in the lock with C. Uh, any more questions? Yes, please. When you, when you said that uh, PQT and BDM and so on were implemented as macros, are you using uh, set junk? Yes, yes, right. I do. Is that not a bit uh, difficult to manage or a bit uh, risky? Um, Z jump and long jump. The question is if it uses Z jump and long jump, and uh, it does. And um, it's not actually really complicated. Um, so at the, at the statement where you have PQT and begin, there is the Z jump, and it stores the IP and stack pointer. And then it goes to an internal begin function, and that's it. Um, because it's the easiest implementation. But then it's not really a transaction, is it? I mean, it's an elaborated lock. Because that is kind of the um, what the transaction is supposed to do. So the transaction goes before you jump in. The transaction goes to one from one consistent state to another consistent state, and that involves error handling and concurrency control. And um, if you fail in between, you end the transaction in inconsistent state. And even if you do error recovery at that point, you still have to restart your transaction. And uh, then why not have this run as part of the transaction framework? Which is the whole point. Do the changes that were already done somehow. But you don't do that by jumping back to the beginning of the beginning. What he said, so can jump forward. You are right. Well, you take some of the things and jump back. Okay. Do I. Uh, which provides true isolation. Isolation means not only undoing, but uh, also keeping. If you have multiple, Time's up. Threads do, do, do I was just. Are we talking about one thread uh, unwinding or undoing or about. Um, because you have some examples of multiple threads. So yeah, but only the, fra only the transaction, the thread, the thread, the, the transaction is thread local, and only on that thread uh, you undo. Okay. Um, I was just told that the time is up for this session. If, you want to have that question answers, please come here and we can talk now. Thank you for attending.